ChildHelp.org states that in 2019 alone, 656,000 victims of child abuse were reported, which is enough to fill 10 modern football stadiums full. In the U.S. alone, an average of five children a day die from physical abuse and neglect. Now, if these sheer numbers weren't grotesque enough, studies also show that 80% of 21-year-olds who reported child abuse met the criteria for at least one psychological disorder and were likely to develop severe alcohol and other drug dependencies, experience depression, attempt suicide, and engage in risky sex earlier and more often than others. These abuses are obviously horrible in their immediate brutality, but even more so in their far-reaching, inextricable effect on the soul of the victims long into adulthood. I'm reminded of the chilling admission made by actor Patrick Stewart of Picard and Professor X fame, who said that he's still in therapy because he witnessed his father beat his mother for years, starting as early as when Patrick was five years old. Patrick is now in his 80s, and it still haunts him. It stuns me that there is no natural statute of limitations on grief like this. So, when I heard that there was a new indie game called You Were Grounded, which tackled this very subject, I was very dubious. I had no faith that it was advisable or even tasteful to make a game about this topic, but somehow, four-man dev team Sepia Studio managed just that, tenderly affirming the beauty of childlike innocence and goodness in even the most miserable situation. So let's get stuck into how this game nails this delicate balance and why it's worth your time. Father hates me, and I hate father, the boy in You Are Grounded chillingly states. Even as someone who's had grueling fights with my father over the years, I always knew reconciliation would come and could never imagine hating my own father, not so for the boy in the basement. His drunken father beats him for the smallest perceived inconvenience. Something is so repugnant to him, he'll find a reason some way, somehow, to make the boy pay for something that happened sometime and somewhere. But why he keeps the boy alive in the basement is initially unclear. You'd think someone filled with such rage would just end it if they hated you so much. Turns out, there is more to the story. But it's a rather fantastical answer that we'll delve into later in the spoiler section. What you need to know for now is that it merely flavors what is a very real and legitimate evil that the game addresses. And thank goodness it does, because I found it such a primal, compelling hook to inhabit an isolated child with little education or love. And as someone who can't quite relate to this situation in real life, it also feels like something I need to live in for a time so I can be more empathetic towards those who have suffered this way. It's a deeply challenging topic to talk about, much less form a supposedly entertaining experience around. So Sepia Games wisely chooses not to dwell on the violence or exploit it for sentimental gain, choosing to inspire instead. But just because it offers whimsical escape from the horrors of the kid trapped in the basement doesn't mean that it doesn't confront some of the worst parts of the situation as well but we'll get to that later. In the meantime, the devs mostly have you experience short gameplay sessions chronicling the child's growth spiritually and physically throughout the years as you do your best to entertain yourself by experimenting with the world around you. Now, you've probably heard that old adage that says kids play in order to learn about their surroundings, and the game's opening levels illustrate just that point. There's a funny meta layer going on, too, as you learn how to play the game yourself while simultaneously playing as the kid learning how to play in general. Initially, Big Basement's grungy aesthetic reminded me of a puppet combo game, but the prevalent physics-based parkour and environmental puzzles really set the game apart from other indie horror games, which aren't usually as mechanically demanding. Most gameplay sequences are platform-related, testing balance and momentum. You'll learn new abilities as you get older, leading to tougher but more exhilarating little adventures around the basement. Sometimes you'll try and knock over a tower of cans like you're bowling, or you'll try and score in the basketball hoop, or scurry across an obstacle course. Or maybe you just want to climb up and peer through the grate to watch TV in the living room where your father is. Now, I'm sure the main reason that the TV plays old cartoons is that they're all free in the public domain, but the subject matter being kids' entertainment transmitted through the cold, digital medium of television 
could also speak to the kid's lack of intimacy with his dad and the burden placed on the child's imagination as the only means of escape. I'm also reminded of that old saying about not letting the TV raise your children. Now, watching TV at all, though, is subject to when and how long your father decides to watch and is only available in some sequences, at least until you find an old remote in the basement and manage to switch to an educational channel that teaches you the alphabet. Now, perhaps it's a coincidence, but this reminded me a lot of when Frankenstein's monster sneaks out at night to go watch through the window as the neighbor girl, Safi, is taught how to read and write in English. She's the daughter of a Christian Arab woman and a Turkish merchant and represents the idealized other that the monster wishes to be, one who is educated and cared for. Ewer Grounded's boy is treated as the other, but like Frankenstein's monster, he has to rely on subterfuge and cunning to learn what should have been taught by his loved ones. The most surprising side effect of this monstrous treatment is how you can relieve yourself and then play with your own feces. Now, apparently this is a textbook trauma response in children and can indicate a lack of taut hygiene, a way to get attention, or simply a way to entertain oneself when isolated. Play is so integral to a child's development because it's not simply a replacement of labor for fun like jaded adults often think. It is the work of a child to play, to learn how the world works through poking, prodding, and experimenting with physics, taste, smell, and all the rest. That the play things can become so gross and dire for a child like this and yet almost exalted by how they innocently use them speaks to how beautiful and guileless children can be even in the midst of brutality. This recursive, bright side thinking is something we bury the older we get, and yet it lingers. Because our age implies our acquaintance with disappointment, we start to guard our hearts from it, plan around it, take less risks. Some of this is certainly maturity, but a lot of it is the fear of failure, of not being seen or heard. And yet, despite our fears, we often find our need for connection causes us to return to even the most cruel people in hopes of reconciliation, in hopes of reclaiming their goodness and having our personhood affirmed. No one can ever really truly not need other people to justify themselves, not even the serial killer who needs other people to aggress upon to feel powerful or important, or the manipulator who has to consider and study the humanity of those they take advantage of in order to know what buttons to push. Sepia Games gets this idea. Sure, the game can be a little whimsical, but it's authentically sweet as well. You'll befriend rats and bugs, and most importantly of all, a black cat named Smelly. You'll play with your crayons and draw pictures on the concrete floor, albeit often very dark interpretations of how your father killed your mother. But even these aren't crime scene drawings used for evidence in court. These are solemn, personal lamentations of what is irretrievably missing. Even when you think the child might be plotting revenge against the father, his artistic self-expression is instead vulnerable and asking for help finding what is lacking. Eventually, these longings tire you out, and you suck into the Sandman, experiencing psychedelic dreams in which you follow golden bugs through air ducts into puzzle rooms before being interrupted by monstrous metaphysical copies of your father. Even here, you can't quite escape him. I do love how so much of the game, especially these dream sequences, is about feeling what you see in the frame, and the game keeps the hand-holding and didactic commentary to a minimum. The accepted silent protagonist trope in games of yore overlaps really well with the child's non-verbal and visually oriented nature. While the game cheats just a bit by adding charming little text pop-ups here and there that contain the child's thoughts, it's an effective immersive first-person experience because goals and motivations are communicated so effortlessly through visual metaphor or conveyed through how assets are angled or colored. Your muteness and the need to stay quiet hyper-focuses your attention on every item in your surroundings, taking every object seriously as something not to be knocked over so your dad doesn't come running. This consideration of space and weight is welcome and impressive for a genre that rarely tries this hard, with only several caveats. The controls are floaty and the collision detection inconsistent, meaning you'll get stuck on geometry a lot or crash into things and fail the level when you thought you judged your momentum correctly. But still, at least the game actually requires you to play it and not just vibe with the atmosphere like so many horror games do. We talk a lot on social media these days about the space we take up and how much we should be allowed to take up and how we're not being granted space and safe space and all of this. And I'll be honest, a lot of it is pushy narcissism disguised as pseudo-intellectual psychobabble. But I think the kid's space is absolutely worth defending here. His situation is a concrete, no pun intended, and three-dimensional metaphor of the lack of space afforded them in the world, effectively being taken off the board of life prematurely, unable to play the game. 
I won't presume to know the intent of the developers and then contort the work to conform to my analysis like some essayists do, but I do think that the boy being denied his place in the world is heavily analogous to the plight of Gregor Samsa in Franz Kafka's 1915 novella Metamorphosis. In this story, Gregor is a traveling salesman who works to pay off his father's debt, but finds that nothing he does in his job actually comes from the heart and is fairly meaningless. Incredibly, Gregor wakes up one morning to discover that he has morphed into a monstrous vermin, often illustrated as a beetle-like creature. Though Kafka was a cleverly ironic writer in that he liked to write deep, emotional stories using disarmingly rigid language derived from law and science, one place in which his diction in the original German is pregnant with connotation is the phrase often translated into monstrous vermin, ungeheuve ungeziefe. Ungeheuve meaning monstrous or huge, while ungeziefe describes something like an unclean animal unfit for sacrifice, a very Old Testament type of term for those animals deemed by God to be unclean and thus unfit for use in worship. This phrase is less than exacting nature, is what translator Susan Bernofsky says is Kafka wanting us to see Gregor's new body and condition with the same hazy focus with which Gregor himself discovers them. Kafka famously said that the form Gregor takes should never be drawn, presumably because the zoological accuracy isn't what's important, but the metaphysical state of someone totally repulsive to those around him. His family resents him now that he can't work anymore and be their cash cow, and they're so horrified by his appearance that they keep Gregor isolated in his room, feeding him but never interacting with him outside of physical abuse. Most cruel of all is Gregor's father, who stomps his feet at Gregor or swings his walking stick at him or slams Gregor's leg in the door or even pelts him with apples at one point. It's super interesting how Gregor's story sheds light and you were grounded, but this will require a brief jump into spoilers, so let's break off into our little small group and whisper interesting secrets amongst ourselves. So, the twist at the end of You Were Grounded is quite Kafka-esque, as they say. The twist is hinted at, but I didn't think to even suspect it was needed, so I brushed off all the signs. But if you listen closely, whenever you scurry around the basement, your movements are accompanied by fluttering or chirping noises. My dumbass missed that these sounds weren't coming from the other vermin in the basement, but from you, the Bat Boy, as you're described in one of the endings. Which feels like a dark bit of wordplay, since your father uses a bat on you. You'll remember I stated earlier how excellent You Were Grounded is at conveyance, at guiding the player without disrupting the illusion of the game world. The game does this even better than I first thought, as it provided me so many clues to the boy's true nature, even if I never see a reflection or an objective rendering of his physicality, only a very abstract self-portrait. I found myself trying to imagine him with the same hazy focus that results from the abstract way in which Gregor Samson's body is described, and how I'm coming to know the boy's physicality indirectly through experience, rather than being given concrete physical evidence to start taxonomizing my avatar's body. You Were Grounded effectively follows Kafka's rule of not giving us a definitive look at the protagonist, and it makes the game all the better for it. You inductively know what you are or what you effectively represent by how you're treated. In Gregor's case, he's become an embodiment of the disdain his family has for him already by using him as their workhorse. The boy in You Were Grounded is similarly hated and shunned because he represents some unforgiven wound in the father's heart. In contrast to Gregor, the boy in You Were Grounded isn't fading away but growing in strength, almost as if the bugs he eats and the dreams he has are giving him natural mystical powers to be able to fight back one day. What's interesting to note too is that Gregor's often portrayed as either a beetle or a cockroach, and there are plenty of cockroaches that you can collect that unlock a special something at the game's end and act as gateways to new powers. So, while that might mean nothing, it does bring a smile to someone like me who sees all these convenient similarities between the book and the game. Now, speaking of these powers, they come to matter most in the final sequence, which begins with you chained to the wall and unable to reach Smelly, who's trapped up in the air ducts and meowing for help. You strain against the chain around your neck, but pass out, experiencing another psychedelic dream in which you follow the cat's spirit till you're attacked by a multitude of monstrous copies of your dad and have to beat them back with a newly discovered ability to spit acid. You awake from the dream suddenly, able to burn away the chain and then the vent cover to get to Smelly but he's died, breaking your heart. At first, I thought you'd accidentally sprayed him with acid trying to free him as his body appears to be steaming, but re-watching the sequence, I'm less sure, and we'll touch on this a little bit later. Regardless, your father, alarmed by your mournful cries at Smelly's death, comes down to set you straight. 
But this is not like the other times. This time, he's not pushing you around. You swell in size or possibly even levitate, intimidating him so badly he realizes you can no longer be contained, and he goes upstairs to retrieve his shotgun. The ending you get is determined by how you respond when he comes back down to face you for good. Ending one is that you escape through the window in the basement, leaving your father behind. And while your presence becomes known publicly thereafter, nothing but one of your lairs filled with cats is ever found. You live in relative peace. Nice. Ending 2 is the most straightforward but the most questionable to me. If you manage to kill your father with an acid shot to the chest, you then go on a mad rampage, killing three random children the same way. I think the moral here is that don't take bloody revenge because it will break you and you'll lose yourself. But positing that this tender, animal-loving child would start murdering other kids just because he's rightfully retaliated just doesn't track at all either from a justice standpoint or from a psychological one. The third ending is the most interesting to me, and occurs if you just let the father kill you. A newspaper article reports that after the father kills his son, he commits suicide. Neighbors report that this father was just taking care of his deformed son after the mom's mysterious disappearance. Now, it's most likely that the father just disposed of her body and told everyone she went missing, but considering how the first suspect in any domestic murder is always the spouse, it seems unlikely that he could get away with this unless there was really no evidence, or just really confusing evidence. The mind races. Is it possible the child killed her by accident? Perhaps from some mishandling of his strength, and maybe the dad covered it up? and didn't want it to get out? It seems unlikely to be the case, but the wording of the newspaper article invites suspicion from me. Now note, this is in no way to justify the father's cruelty. There's no excuse for what he does to you regardless of whether you accidentally killed your mother or not. But with these ingredients, I think I can write a better ending than what I got here. Here goes. Remember how I said earlier that I thought I'd accidentally burnt Smelly in the process of trying to free him? I thought I could see Smelly's body steaming like I had accidentally hit him while trying to remove the vent cover, and it almost feels like this has to be the case because Smelly somehow dies in the time it takes for you to wake up from your dream, which couldn't have been that long at all. No way does Smelly suffocate or starve right after a mewing for the first time, you fall asleep, gain your power, then use that power to undo the vent, and then he's dead? I don't think so. And isn't it a far more tragic and interesting scene if I accidentally hurt the ones I love despite my good intentions? That's true tragedy in the Greek sense, an intrinsic flaw that proves the undoing of the main character. This would also make the father a more interesting, realistically conflicted character because he's not just cruel and an alcoholic. He's that, but driven understandably mad when his own child accidentally kills his mother through some mishandling of his strength or something like that. Now, in this version of the story, because it's accidental and his paternal instinct prevents him from outright murdering his child, he splits the difference, keeping him alive with scraps of food, but also brutally beating him. In this version of events, the father is still capable of believable, relatable reactions to this heart-rending accident, and the true villain he becomes not in the initial repulsion, but in the vindictive way in which the father handles it. Okay, well that's all I got as far as spoilers, so let's jump back in and summarize briefly for those who wanted to save the game's ending for themselves. So, while the ending is a little fantastical and sometimes a little loose in its characterization, it doesn't undermine the chilling nature of the child's situation, nor does it exclude a positive, useful message of healing and coping with such trauma. Even the most vengeful ending still carries with it a message of warning, that reacting violently as the father does will have drastic consequences. I'm not my father, the boy insists and he proves it by his tender feelings towards his mother and his affection for animals. So, by the game's end, you're given three choices of how to reckon with your abusive father. So choose wisely, because while you're playing as the child, you're also by extension his parent now, too, responsible for how he turns out. I highly recommend you watch all three of these endings, either by replaying the game and experiencing them all firsthand, or watching them all on YouTube, as they'll retroactively give you a much deeper appreciation of the game's story and message. I'm really glad that I was able to get past my initial repulsion at the subject matter of this game and give it an honest chance to impress me. I'd encourage you to do the same. You can buy it for as little as $10 on itch.io, or more if you want to tip the developer. You Were Grounded is conceptually intimidating at first, but it proves a striking and thoughtful meditation on goodness triumphing in the face of abuse. And I'm glad I took time out of my day to engage this challenging topic and come out the other side a little harrowed, but hopeful. Oh, well, thanks for watching, everyone. This will be the last video I do before my big franchise retrospective of all things Alone in the Dark, including the movies and games, and will explore its important role in defining survival horror, and why you don't hear very much about it anymore, and why you should. It should be a great time, and I hope to see you there on the 28th.
And that's not all that's happening on the 28th. I'll also be guest spotting on Cult of the Cyber Skull's big Halloween video on Visage that day, so please check out what will likely be a very detailed and interesting experience. Oh, and while we're doing shoutouts, I'd like to introduce you to a new competitor in the video essay space, Lord of the RPG with very confusing underscores. He's a genuine, enthusiastic guy and is making some pretty cool short-form content right now on games like Dead Rising and Prey, so check him out and show him some love. Happy Halloween season, nerds! Thank you.